Hey everyone and welcome back to another edition of going to free museums in Singapore. Now I know I said okay no sit down videos, no filming by myself but I feel like you guys as well as I need another edition of this series. So I guess let's make an exception for this series. I went to four museums in total and that's what I'll be presenting in this video starting off with the National Museum. So the first exhibit that I went to is unique to only Singaporeans and PRs. It is this one. There you go, here's the ticket for it as well. So it's the Experiencing Singapore through the 1800s to the 2000s. Basically, it talks about how Singapore was through the times, including flight companies that were popular in Singapore back in the day, as well as methods of transportation to get to Singapore via flight, as well as to get around in Singapore via things such as rickshaws and later on the MRT. So they also show you some pictures of when the first MRT was slated to be opened when it opened as well as easeling cards from the past to what we know today including certain very cute themed ones such as festivals as well as National Day. It also talks about how tourism grew in Singapore such as hotels that opened from the early 1900s all presented as postcards and as well as the uniforms that the hotel staff wore and the room service, the items for guests that was placed in the rooms. It also had a section about food in Singapore including the kopi culture as well as the variety of drinks that were served. The B1 floor along with this exhibit also had another exhibit which is called this. I'm not going to attempt to butcher the name. Basically it talks about how the forefathers of our country had issues getting everyone together to unite as one. It is the Singapore History Gallery and they have a pretty fixed timeline from when Singapore was just a settlement named Singapura to when it was a crown colony to Shonanto as well as to present day Singapore. So life in the settlement of Singapore were described through archaeological findings, a lot of photographs and prominent people present at the time including Sultan Hussein and Tan Tok Singh that helped to form a connection with the British to enable more global connections. As a British colony, the economy grew, people began to gain skills in a few industries including manual labour, selling pottery and goods and even medicine. More people immigrated to Singapore and formed communities of their own. The people at the time as well as the British rulers were all depicted in form of photographs and some displays. I do feel that there could have been more of them just to help us establish a connection better. The next part was the Shionanto aka the occupation of the Japanese within Singapore. The exhibit did a good job of displaying how strong the Japanese forces were in terms of its appearance as well as military strongholding and capabilities and what the people of Singapore faced at the time. Then came real founders of the country including people such as Lee Kuan Yew and the exhibits explained all the political transformations that the nation endured in order to prosper. And I actually liked that there were statistics to show how profoundly Singapore had progressed as a nation. I also went to this exhibit called Glass Rotunda Story of the Forest to connect with the natural landscapes of Singapore. The first part of the exhibit is like a nice roundabout of very brightly lit um, <laughs> dark wall nice smelling screen with flowers and animals. <laughs> it's, the, it's pretty aesthetic, sensorily appealing and pleasing but like what's the point? I in fact like the second part of the exhibit better where they show you different species of trees that you can find around Singapore. I also went to a life in Singapore exhibit both the modern colony sub exhibit as well as the growing up or voices of Singapore exhibit. They were located pretty close so I wasn't able to discriminate which is which exactly. So the modern colony one describes about um, what people like in terms of modern entertainment, what they like to do for fun, as well as modern cultural spaces. Personally, I found it a bit hard to connect with this exhibit, but I figure that someone maybe two or three generations older than me would have found it really fun and nostalgic. The Growing Up exhibit was probably my favourite. I like that it binds together recounts and interviews from Singaporeans from the past and how it all ties together into a story. It's a story of people of different cultures, backgrounds and ages coming together in common spaces such as schools and they also bond together over things like film, music, food and games. So overall, I had pretty high expectations of the National Museum and it definitely did deliver. While I enjoyed some exhibits more than others, I think all of them were comprehensive yet not overwhelming which is a pretty tough balance to achieve. I think I had a really good time here and if you like museum aesthetics or like doing photo shoots in museums, you've come to the right place because this place is very aesthetic. So the next museum I visited is the Asian Civilization Museum and all of the Asian Civilization Museums, this one as well as the other museum I went to, have a map or like a little guide 
that they give you at the counter so it's easy for you to navigate all of the exhibits so the level one uh, exhibit started off with the trade and maritime silk roots exhibit so this level has a replica of the outline of the ship's design as well as archaeological findings from the Tang shipwreck bound to China from the Middle East. What you recover helps you understand who were the intended customers of the items as well as the customers' backgrounds. The findings revealed that Chinese, Japanese, Indonesian as well as Indian people made up a significant majority of the sellers and migrants that were coming into Singapore. Level 2 was about the faith and belief galleries and I found the Christian art portion of the gallery quite interesting, frankly because I didn't know it existed. <laughs> Anyways, there was a whole other section about ancestors and rituals that covered a lot of deities within Hinduism, Buddhism, as well as relics that were used for praying rituals. There was also a segment on ancient religions which stem way back from what you know today. And while I'm not specifically interested in this section, I can appreciate how much care and effort that you need to take in order to scope out the relevant relics. Islamic art actually had a separate room to itself and it's interesting how they showed prayer items and boxes with scriptures and writings on it that's significant to Islam and how their crafts were inspired by nature and animals. This pattern carried to the clothes they used as well. Some things in this exhibit were really nice such as the small and intriguing details. So for instance, they also explained why Islamic crafters at the time decided to use geometric patterns for their crafts. Level 3 is the materials and designs gallery and the jewelry portion of this gallery is always nice to see and we learned why it was so important and significant to use gold jewelry in Southeast Asian communities and the power that it really holds as well as its representations. The ceramic section was also pretty informative as they displayed how people made ceramics in the past, what type of ceramics are common as well as ceramics that were specific to a particular race or group of people and some that I just thought were plain pretty. The whole idea of exchanging ideas as well as technology carried over to the fashion aspect as well where you can see different countries using the same kinds of fabrics such as silk and cotton but with different designs, patterning and silhouettes. It was also really cool to see influences from their own local culture as well as influences from Western culture being matrimonized or harmonized in the clothes. The Asian Civilizations Museum is a joy to visit. You can pick whichever exhibits you want to see, no pressure. I personally enjoyed the level 1 exhibits as well as the level 3 exhibits the most. There's a lot to see, to learn and to appreciate. One thing to note though that it's not a national civilization, it's Asian civilization. So you can expect to see variety more than just Singapore. So if you were to go there with an open mind as well as a willingness to learn, you'll enjoy yourself. The next museum we visited is the Paranakan Museum, which is actually the sister museum of the Asian Civilization Museum. So the level one exhibit is the Origins exhibit. The first exhibit actually answers the questions of who Paranakan people are as well as their origin. So the exhibit starts with interviews and recounts of Paranakans currently living in Singapore. They shared photos of themselves as well as their family members from several generations. Then we moved to answering the question of where Puranakans are from and they showed a map showing where the early migrants came from and the interactive videos there helped to display the different trade routes that were used at the time as well as the people that were responsible for establishing a Puranakan community. The exhibit also juxtaposes to the future of Puranakan, so how the Puranakan community has globalized and spread to other countries as well. Level 2 was the home exhibit featuring ceramics and food culture. First up was the family and community life exhibit where they showed the life of Puranakan inhabitants. Everything that they used from the cabinets to the tables and chairs, the praying vessels, it all felt so ornate. The decor is very eye-catching, the details itself is very nice, and you can see that they use animals in their wood carvings. Something I noticed right away is that Puranakans used to love making as well as serving sire in their homes, which translates to piper betel or in Hindi known as pan. And I was pretty surprised to know that betel leaf consumption was so popular outside of South Asia. I didn't know that it existed among Puranakans. There was also a ceramics exhibit specifically for Nonya ware. And what they used was determined by what 
they were exposed to as well as their daily practices. Everything from altars and finger bowls to teapots were commonplace for use in Peranakan homes. I also really like the display of the family dinner eating service of the Yap family, which is an elaborate dinnerware set that is traced back to one specific Peranakan family. Many families in the past also had their own unique style and motifs that they used to mark their own dinnerware sets with, which I found was so cool. And here's also some festive wear that I really enjoyed looking at the vibrant colours of. Level 3 was the style exhibit, so it's all the batiks, textiles, jewellery, fashion, all of that. This section first described how the Peranakan Chinese were actually really creative and experimenting with different dyes and experimenting with different patterns to create batik fabrics. So this batik was used for articles of clothing of different types as well as home furnishings such as curtain drapes, tablecloths, and bedding. And this is a wedding bed from back in the day. Where do you sleep? Decorative textiles that had honestly no real use was also growing in popularity at that time. With rugs, lanterns, and wall pieces, people from different regions also put their own little twists and flair into it. Next up was the jewellery exhibit, which showed a lot of pieces that were influenced by many different parts of the community. They were also made with different class groups and societal rules in mind, and some of them I found that they were super pretty. And similar to the jewellery, different Southeast Asian communities also influenced how clothing was made for fashion. This influenced decisions such as the type of cloth used, as well as the style, the colours. The kabaya is the most traditional and popular way of dressing up back then, and the accessories that were chosen to match were also really pretty. There are also some speciality kabayas at the back of the exhibit that I really like to look at. Overall, I think that the insights that this museum has into the life and culture of the Peranakan people is really nice and whatever is there is really well curated. But I do think that the museum is a bit small, so I would have loved to see how Peranakan people actually gelled into the Singapore community and how they earned their bread and like how they earned a living. I think that would have been nice to see and would have added to their presentation of a lot more. But definitely worth a visit if you're in the area. The last museum I visited is the National Gallery and they had a lot of things going on when I went. There are many exhibits here so I'll focus on the ones that I visited. I first visited the See Me, See You early video installation in Southeast Asia. And this is a two-part exhibition. I went to the first part, the second part's coming out in October. The whole exhibit was a commentary on how audiences can be engaged in a visual sense as well as in a temporal, kinesthetic sense, especially when modern technology in terms of photography was still not a thing. And I found this exhibit pretty interesting because I had not seen any art installations or any installations rather with cathode ray tube television in it. Level 2 was made up of all the DBS galleries, galleries 1, 2 and 3. So the galleries first started off showing visual representations of the straight settlement that's made up of Singapore, Malacca and Penang and how it held navigatory as well as biological significance. There were also paintings of migrants that had entered Singapore from their respective lands, including Hakka families as well as people from Bali. But overall, I feel like I had problems connecting the significance of the paintings there to the point of the exhibit. I found that they were a little random, so I was having trouble linking. So instead of this exhibit, one of the other DBS galleries I really enjoyed. It was a collaboration between Polytechnic students as well as the Light Tonight festivals using an AR filter, so it was an AR themed exhibit and it is how you can see art from more than just one dimension. The guy there was really eager to show uh, these filters off and see how you can reimagine art. I really enjoyed the interactive aspect of this exhibit in general. Level 3 housed the photography exhibit of Southeast Asia as well as a special exhibition. And disclaimer, some of the photos in here may be a little graphic. The main point of this exhibit is to show how artists can use photography to depict points in history and their hidden meanings and how audiences, even just from viewing it, can feel involved. There was a pretty elaborate compilation of photographs involving people that were impacted by as well as involved within the Vietnam War. And if you were to read some of the text in English that is written on one of the accompanying cards, it's pretty moving as well as graphic and overall I thought it was a pretty impactful installation. There were also some photos uh, depicting Singapore from the 60s and 70s showing unrest within the country and some planning decisions that were taken to enrich the country. Moving on to the special exhibition, the special exhibition showcased 
a lot of different European style portrait photography that had gained popularity amongst both influential as well as common people. So everyone from performers to commoners, military personnel and religious devotees got their pictures taken to both capture memories as well as enhance their perception of their identity. Again, the pictures taken are really nice as the and, and the whole exhibition is pretty expansive but I'm not really sure how it ties in with the whole idea of the floor as well as the whole vibe of the museum. Level 4 houses the Aki Gallery as well as the, the Wu Guangzong Gallery. So I'll start off with the Aki Gallery first. So it has, the, it has two Aki Galleries that shows how the National Gallery building came about in the first place. So the history of the plot of the land on which the National Gallery is built was explained really well from the 1920s and its purpose of building the gallery first to meet the needs of the people. There were also some archaeological captures of the design as well as the materials used almost from the transformation to the conservation pot as well. Afterwards, I visited the Wu Guangzhong Gallery which features works from an artist name Liu. He paints with a really unique style. I really love looking at mountains and streams so this was already a delight but the textures and the colours used really drew me in and it's overall super unique. This museum is pretty classic visit if you don't really know where to visit in Singapore. I think that some of the exhibits in this gallery were big hits but some of the other exhibits I found that I just couldn't really establish the links between what is being said in the exhibit versus what the real message is. And that could be because the way the, the exhibits are being laid out in the museum or it honestly likely just could be me. And that concludes part 2 of this video. I chose to go to museums that were situated more in town so that if you wish to visit all 4 of them in the same day, you could. Let me know if there's any other museums that you think fit the requirement of this series. I have about 8 more museums on this list so you can expect to see a part 3 to this series. Till next time, peace out and I'll see you again soon. Bye!